fix Tuesday, March 8th, and according to your Bobby Destiny Morning News update. Government will continue to closely monitor the price movements in the energy sector. So says Minister of Energy and Business Development, Gary Simmons, amid concerns from sections of society about the recent hike in fuel prices. Bobby Destiny's Karim Smith reports. As the price of gasoline soared well above $4 a litre on Monday, the business community and ordinary citizens expressed concern about the implications for specific industries, but also on the cost of living as a whole. No petroleum-based product was spared as gas went to $4.13 per litre. Diesel rose by $0.17 cents per litre to $3.46 and kerosene rose by $0.22 cents to $1.80 per litre. Energy Minister Kerry Simmons promised to closely monitor the movements in the energy sector and address all of the options at government's disposal to determine the most appropriate intervention. The Energy Minister also stressed that tax or revenue policy is the domain of the Ministry of Finance when asked about the request from taxi operators to have road tax removed or government's election promise of reduced freight prices to stabilise the cost of living. When asked to respond to criticism about the seemingly short time frame between the start of the conflict and the gas price hikes, Simmons cited articles as long ago as Christmas Eve warning of economic instability over the bolstering of Russian forces at the Ukrainian border. Kareem Smith for Barbados Today. Former chairman of the Association of Public Transport Operators, Morris Lee, has been looking at ways for public service vehicle owners to retrofit their vehicles as a means of cutting the operating costs of diesel and gasoline. He made other disclosure as workers in the sector brace for the impact from the recent hike in fuel prices. Lee said his research showed that there was an opportunity for PSV owners to import what he said were retrofit kits that convert their vehicles from diesel or gasoline to battery operated. So you don't have to buy a vehicle, you just have to remove the power plant, which is the engine, and fit this battery operated kit onto it and obviously then you're putting the battery back and you have a battery operated electric PSV vehicle. Right? Now now if this if we can successfully do this, it will open not only an opportunity for other vehicles and barbers to go to go in that direction, but it will also Give us the opportunity to do something like this through the Caribbean, and this can be a major for a change earner for Barbados. Mm -hmm. Right? So, um, we're looking at having it patented and, and so on um, in terms of the, the, the kit, we'll have bits and pieces from different suppliers, right? But the actual comp, the actual kit as a package will be unique. So that technically will involve like intellectual property and all that kind of thing. Barbados has ranked fifth among countries in the Eastern Caribbean and the French departments with the highest vaccination rates. The findings were revealed during an event on Monday involving the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, and the International Telecommunications Union. In October last year, the entities launched a public health education campaign designed to tackle the high level of misinformation about the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccine hesitancy. Digicel was also part of the effort. PAHO, WHO's representative for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, Dr. Yetis Gibre, said his organization was pleased to collaborate with the partners in an effort to help countries attain at least 70% vaccine coverage. The information has to continue. Uh, we have to uh, uh, educate. Uh, it's not only educating, but providing the right message through the right channel as we have been doing with our partners like Digicel, ITU, and others. So um, it's a matter of working harder than what we have been doing. Uh, definitely we're going to reach that target if uh, people are receiving the messages appropriately. There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, I am Onika. I am a mother, I'm a daughter, and I'm a wine educator. 
When vaccines first came on the scene last year, I was really apprehensive about getting vaccinated. I was worried about taking a drug that I felt was experimental. So at first, I really wasn't about it. I decided to get vaccinated. I had to acknowledge the fact that I am asthmatic and my son is also asthmatic. I have a career in wine. We depend on our senses and I decided that I did not want to risk it for being afraid of taking a vaccine. Coronavirus has affected everyone around the globe. And keeping this in mind, make sure that your decision is not a selfish one and that you're thinking of the benefits of the whole. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To developments in the region, St. Lucia's Prime Minister Philip G. Pierre and law enforcement officials condemn the murder of an off-duty police officer. Police Constable Nathan Timet was gunned down over the weekend during a cash escort with a fellow police officer who is currently listed in critical condition. More from DBS News. Police Commissioner Milton Deasin says that the killing of Officer Timet has sent a chilling message to the Royal St. Lucia Police Force and the St. Lucian public. It's just a sad feeling yeah, for the force and um, everybody sympathizing, especially with the family of a hardworking officer. I know we need to heighten in terms of the security of the state, but um, we are doing that. But however, what happened there, um, if at all anybody was not concerned, they need to be concerned now. Prime Minister Philip J.P. has also maintained a zero-tolerance approach to acts of violence in St. Lucia. However, he says a collective approach is needed to curb the spate of violent behavior on the island. Violence is not acceptable and then we have to do whatever we, we can do to avoid that the scourge of violence has infected our country. It, and these situations have arisen for a long time now. It's manifested itself now. It's happened for a long time. And then we have to find ways collectively to deal with that situation. And finally, on the international front, a decline in hostilities has seen a sharp decrease in civilian casualties, but the human rights situation for many Afghans is still of profound concern. That's according to United Nations Human Rights Chief Michelle Batchley. She told the Human Rights Council that Afghan people face a devastating humanitarian and economic crisis. More than half the population now suffer extreme levels of hunger. An increase in child labor, child marriage and the sale of children have been observed. Following the Taliban's takeover, international sanctions that previously applied to the Taliban effectively became sanctions on the country's de facto governing authorities. The resulting liquidity crisis contributed to a full-scale economic crash. In addition, non-humanitarian aid to the country on which almost every essential state function had been dependent prior to the Taliban takeover was suspended. The Security Council's adoption in December of Resolution 2615 to accept humanitarian transactions is a welcome first step to enable work that could save millions of lives. For Afghan women and girls, the directives and actions taken by the de facto authorities have curtailed women's fundamental rights and freedoms. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbidestoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.